Heyo, and what is up, gang? Thank you for checking out Sledgehammer TV tonight. You know, if the trained monkeys that were writing this show called Monday Night Raw was the team that was in charge back in the 90s during the Attitude Era and all of those great heyday moments of the WWE, this whole industry would be dead. They can't formulate a coherent thought they can't put together a decent show. You got three hours of entertainment to fill and you fail at it tremendously on a weekly basis. How USA or any network that this show has ever had since it's gone to three hours has not canceled their agreement with the WWE due to the sheer amount of trash that they put on their networks. I don't understand how it's impossible. I would have canceled this show a hundred times over if I was a head executive of any network watching this trash and having this on my network. I would be embarrassed. As a wrestling fan, I'm embarrassed, and you should be embarrassed, and we are going to talk about all the reasons why right here, right now. My name is Nick Nightmare. You are watching the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show's Monday Night Raw review and reaction show. Let's do it. <laughs> Two weeks out from WrestleMania, you don't have a segment for the world heavyweight champion. Bobby Lashley, who was victorious at WrestleMania defending his championship, you had nothing for him tonight. AJ Styles and Omos won the WWE Raw Tag Team Championships at WrestleMania two weeks ago. And for the second week in a row, you had nothing for your Raw Tag Team division for the men, but you gave us the garbage you gave us regarding the women's division? Now, I am no person to stand up for some of the talent in the women's tag team division, but you have to do better than that. You made all of the girls involved in the segment that you guys wrote look like complete idiots. Absolutely unbelievable just how clueless this company is at writing actual storylines, writing compelling television, or simply just writing something that makes sense. Can you explain to me why for one minute, Nia Jax and Shayna Baszler, the Raw Women's Tag Team Champions, would stop fighting in their match just to watch clips of themselves being embarrassed because the nip and slip connection came out in the middle of a match they had nothing to do with. Started to roll some beautiful bean footage. We got to see everybody falling down at WrestleMania. We got to see Nia Jax falling down last week. And all of this is going down in the middle of a match in which all four competitors stopped wrestling to watch fucking TV. It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to the women involved, and it's embarrassment to your show. This is not what you want to see on a professional wrestling show. This is not what you would want to see on any show. Would you like to see people just stop what they're doing and watch a screen while we have a physical contest going on? All for them to find a way to have Nia Jax leave the match? Nia Jax left to go chase the nip and slip connection. Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. Why are you calling them that? Well, were you blind? At WrestleMania, Mandy Rose slipped on her ass and Dana Brooke had a nip slip. So they are now forever known as the nip and slip connection. Or the nip slip squad. Well, we already have a squad. There's a riot squad. They're the nip and slip connection. And they ruined... Not that it was a great match. Who gives a shit about Shayna Baszler versus Naomi and Lana for the 19,000th time anyway? But this was just an excuse to what? To start some dissension between the champions? Because we know how the WWE likes to do that. It was garbage. It was hot garbage and it stunk of high hell. And, and you couldn't write something for AJ and almost? I had to watch this instead? I had to watch the Charlotte Flair show for nearly three hours? Charlotte Flair 
We had to see her promo from last week because, you know, we can't have enough Charlotte on this show, especially if you're Vince McMahon. He must really be in love with this broad. I don't understand what it is. But, hey, listen, we got some breaking news in regards to Charlotte as I'm checking over on my Twitter feed right now. According to the WWE Twitter account, breaking news. You heard it here first. Charlotte Flair has been suspended indefinitely and fined $100,000 for unprofessional conduct following what she did in the main event tonight after she lost to Asuka in another ridiculous match with a stupid screwy kind of finish where Asuka won, but only due to the interference of Rhea Ripley. Charlotte Flair flips out and starts beating up the referees, and now because of this, she's going to be gone for an indefinite amount of time. So if she was going to be missing TV for X amount of dates, maybe she's got some sort of a Hollywood commitment or something, I say good riddance, I don't need to see any more Charlotte Flair, I'm sick to death of her already, she's only been back for two weeks talking shit, saying, oh, everybody was talking about Charlotte at WrestleMania because Charlotte wasn't at WrestleMania. We weren't. We were very happy and we were relieved that Charlotte wasn't a part of either night of WrestleMania because I'm sick to death of this character. And I don't give a shit whether she's heel Charlotte, babyface Charlotte, tweener Charlotte. It doesn't matter to me. I'm sick to death of Charlotte Flair. So if we had to go through this three-hour abomination of a TV show just to get her off of the show for a couple of weeks, is that the only positive swing we could take from tonight's Monday Night Raw? Pretty much. Pretty much. She came out in the middle of the show to do her typical Charlotte Flair promo, dressing up in one of Seth Rollins' jackets, bored the shit out of us, for Asuka to come out. You know Asuka never really gets in to the promo action. And if she does decide to say something, it's usually in her native tongue and it doesn't really make much sense to the American audience who don't know or speak Japanese. So we knew Asuka wasn't going to say much. And then they had Rhea Ripley come out and she didn't say very much either. They scripted her very poorly, just like a majority of tonight's show. It was just terrible. It really was. It made a three-hour show feel like it took three decades to get through. By the time we got to the 9.30 mark, I thought we were almost done. And then I took a look at my clock and I was like, oh my God, we've only gotten halfway through this show? This is a show where they booked a Ms. and Mrs. celebration. This is a show where they originally announced Randy Orton was going to face Braun Strowman for the first time ever and just completely scrapped that idea and gave Randy Orton Matt Riddle to play with. And now you know the game we like to play. It's time to play Riddle Me This. Riddle Me This, Sledgeheads of Sledge Nation. What the hell are they doing with Randy Orton and Matt Riddle? Why does Randy Orton not know who Matt Riddle is. Randy Orton seriously doesn't watch the program. He's never bumped into him backstage before. Matt Riddle's never scooted by him and been like, sup, Randy, how you doing? In all these weeks, Randy Orton is too big of a star to give a shit about Matt Riddle. This is a guy that comes out with no shoes, right? Randy pointed that out. Who's this guy? I don't even know who his name, I don't know, I don't know what his name is. I don't want to know his name. Don't even tell me his name. I just want to teach him some respect. All because Matt Riddle came by and did his five-year-old stoner gimmick talking about, hey, wouldn't it be cool, man? Wouldn't it be cool, man, if we were like a tag team, you know, because you lost your match and I lost my match and together we could be the RK, RK bros, man. You know, man. I can get you a scooter. We can put fangs on it, man. So Randy Orton was getting as annoyed as every single one of us. The look on Randy Orton's face during that segment was the look on my face through the entirety of this ridiculous show. It's just so ridiculous. Right now, all I wanted... Once Randy Orton challenged Matt Riddle to this match was for Randy to punt him in the head so hard that he forgot this gimmick and went back to being normal Matt Riddle. 
I just hate it. Flipping his friggin' birds out his feet. Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. I am embarrassed to be a wrestling fan after the show we got tonight. This show kicked off with Drew McIntyre coming out talking about how Randy and Big Braun were pissed off that he was getting the rematch against Bobby Lashley or that he was calling out Bobby Lashley for a rematch. They got their balls in a twist. I'm paraphrasing, obviously. They don't say phrases like that on Monday Night Raw. But he spoke about T-Bar and Mace and how they tried to, to get over at his expense. And he knows the mastermind was MVP. And he said, oh, I wonder if they'll take off their stupid masks and start wearing suits. And I'm like, are these people really listening to my show? Because I said that's what they should have done if they were really doing this retribution hurt business 2.0 but that's besides the point that's all I wanted was for them to take off their masks and change that gimmick just wash away the stink of retribution right off of you apparently Drew McIntyre thought the same thing was going to happen but anyway this whole thing with McIntyre going on and on was uh, brought out MVP who, of course, had some shit to say back to Drew McIntyre, but it wasn't really about that. It was about a sneak attack by the former Retribution teammates, T-Bar and Mace, who would attack Drew McIntyre and leave him laying. They didn't acknowledge MVP. MVP seemed happy about this, obviously, but they're not really going all in with this. right? It, it's not making sense, like, is he recruiting them or not? Are they with MVP and Bobby Lashley or not? But MVP made a good point when he said to Drew McIntyre, listen, we already shed some weight from the Hurt Business. Bobby Lashley stood on his own and beat you with no help whatsoever, which is true. So I don't understand what the point of even having this T-Bar and Mace thing is. It just... If you're going to try to get them over, you're going to do it at the expense of some of your biggest stars. So Drew McIntyre being pissed about this, he goes to Adam Pearce, he demands a match between the two big men, and gets it. And now I'm thinking to myself at this point, there's no way this ends up being just a handicap match. Somebody is going to come out and bail out Drew McIntyre. I couldn't have imagined for my life that it was going to be the jolly green Braun Strowman. The Braun Strowman train. Woo, woo, woo. But Strowman McIntyre as a team is not something that has me excited. It's not something that has me interested in the fact that you're putting them together to possibly maybe try to get T-Bar and Mace over on their own. It's It's a good thought, but it's just bad execution. Because you have teams on the roster that need to be showcased, right? And you could have done the Viking Raiders, since you had them return, set up them to go into a feud with these two guys. Instead of putting them against Strowman and Braun, uh, Strowman and Drew, why not use the Viking Raiders and you get each other over by having a long-standing feud between two teams that are trying to establish themselves in the tag team division instead of using the Viking Raiders to do a rematch from last week where we seen the exact same result. The Viking Raiders beat Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin last week in less than five minutes. This week they did the same thing. Instead of doing something interesting and taking either one of those two teams and playing them off of the T-Bar Mace thing, it seems so simple when you think about it. But instead, we just get rinse and repeat really awful wrestling by the world's worst entertainment company. And while we're talking about some of the worst entertainment, I do have to to just take a minute to say that this new guy on commentary, Adnan, whatever his name is, he's just not doing it just yet. I know it's only his second week, but he sounds almost like a teenager. I don't know. I don't know. Like he's. His, his levels and just the way he comes across as a commentator just doesn't feel like it fits the tone of the show. You know, and, and Graves just kind of overpowers him. And then you got Saxton on the other side. And it just, 
the chemistry is not there yet. Maybe that's it, but I don't know. Right now, he's just not really appealing to me. I don't understand the need for the change. I thought Tom Phillips was just fine. I thought Samoa Joe was just fine. But yet, now we're going into a new year of Raw post-WrestleMania with this new announced team, and it's not really doing anything to make the presentation better overall. So then after the opening match, which was the Viking Raiders and Shelton and Alexander in the repeat from last week, we get Matt Riddle interrupting an interview with Randy Orton on the scooter, man. Let's do it, man. Let's be RK bros, man. Randy Orton didn't say a thing. He just friggin' walked away looking very, very annoyed. He then went to Adam Pearce after the break, and once again, I don't know who this kid is, but he wants a match against this guy who rides around on a scooter because he needs a lesson in respect. They didn't even talk about the change in the card. They just, you know, I guess they know card subjects to change, right? So we don't have to explain ourselves because it says it in fine print on the bottom. Charlotte Flair's pr- first promo of the night, like we talked about briefly already, was interrupted by Asuka, which was interrupted by Rhea Ripley. Absolutely nothing was said. Charlotte Flair was just cringe. Absolutely cringeworthy. Talking about how she actually respects Asuka and all this stuff, but she doesn't like Asuka. She keeps calling herself the opportunity. What? What? It doesn't even make sense. Why would you want that to be your name? I am the opportunity. No, you're not. It doesn't make sense. I friggin' hate it. I hate it. She talked about the women in the back all hating each other as much as they hate her, but they all pretend to like each other, but they shouldn't be complaining because unlike her, they didn't have a schedule their scheduled WrestleMania moment taken away from her. She could beat both Rhea Ripley and Asuka. Asuka then interrupted, but Charlotte wouldn't let her speak. Every time Asuka tried to say something, she kept telling her, shut up, I don't want you to speak, be quiet, all this real disrespectful stuff to Asuka, even though she says she respects Asuka and clearly didn't, clearly didn't act that way. Finally, Asuka had enough of her bullshit and screamed at her, I will beat you, bitch. Ooh, Asuka said the B word, so you know things are getting serious now. This was terrible. This was absolutely terrible. <sighs> Matt Riddle defeated Randy Orton in a decent match. I mean, it was okay. It, the the good thing about it was that Riddle won clean. I guess maybe they're going to actually try to build this guy up. Is this going to be a longer term feud between Randy and Riddle? I don't understand where they're going, why they made this change, and I appreciate them moving around some of the pieces and shifting things in different directions, but this just seems odd. right? So Riddle gets a big win on Monday Night Raw over a big legend like Randy Orton, Where this goes, nobody knows. Could it be interesting? Maybe. Will it be? Probably not, because at the end of the day, this is the WWE, and by the time we get to next Monday, they might just scrap the whole thing because Vince has a new idea about giving Matt Riddle thought bubbles that comes out of the back of his scooter now, too. Who the hell knows with this freaking company? We got a segment for Sheamus. Sheamus won the United States Championship at WrestleMania. Nice to see somebody with some gold on this show besides the dreaded women's tag team champions. Adam Pearce is saying that Sheamus could be one of the great United States champs and some of the champs of the past always had open challenges. John Cena even did it every week. Do you know why they do open challenges? Well, that's the clear sign of we don't know what the fuck to do this week, so let's just have the champ go out and issue an open challenge. But Sheamus gets a little bit of a one-up here, and this was never, I think, done before, and I kind of appreciated this somewhat, where Sheamus said he's not John Cena, and he would do an open challenge, but he's not just going to put his title up for any schlub to come out and try to take it from him. And when you see the guy that came out to challenge him tonight, you will know that he made the right decision. Not, I mean, not that it matters, because there's no way he would have lost to this guy. But you understand the logic, right? And as a champion, I think I would be in the same thing. Why do I have to just openly challenge anybody? 
they should be fighting to earn the opportunity to face me. Not the not Charlotte Flair the opportunity. You don't want to earn that. You can leave that off to the side. If they want an actual opportunity at my championship, they should earn it like everybody else does. By beating me in a singles match, probably, if the WWE has their way. But, like, so that's, I appreciated the way they were going with that. I didn't appreciate the next segment to come, which was the tag team championships for the women, which we touched upon at the in the open of the show. One of the worst segments I have ever seen take place on Monday Night Raw. Naomi and Lana, why they're even having this match after Jax and Baszler beat them 17 times already in the last two months, it, it doesn't matter because there's only three tag teams on Raw. There's only Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. There's Lana and Naomi. And there's Jax and Baszler. That's it. So how are we going to do anything when you fired so, four other females that could have been used in this scenario, but you, but you don't have the talent to do a women's tag team division? You just don't have the numbers. But you're going to continue to do it. And you're going to continue to fail. Because we keep getting shit like this. In the middle of this match. That Lana and Naomi are having with the champions. The nip slip connection come out. Start showing all of their. Past. Blunders. WWE trying to. Really continue that momentum like remember when Nia Jax busted her hole and then for like three weeks we had to see my hole well now we're going to keep seeing Mandy Rose slip and fall we're going to keep seeing Nia Jax slip and fall because they don't know how to book pro wrestling and the whole entire match came to a standstill to watch these clips and when the clips were done and Mandy and Dana were laughing on the entrance nipping and slipping (laughs) Nia Jax left the match Left Shayna Baszler all alone. And then Shayna Baszler ends up getting pinned on Monday Night Raw. Which is a travesty in and of itself. And all of this seemingly are planting the seeds of them finally possibly breaking up. And I don't care. I don't care. Nia Jax left her match to go chase down two women for showing some silly clips. Leaving her partner exposed. And not for nothing, Shayna Baszler could have probably beaten Naomi and Lana by herself with one arm tied behind her back. I'm talking about real Shayna Baszler. NXT Shayna Baszler would not have lost that match. She would have found a way to win. She's a badass. Shouldn't be being (laughs) scripted to look like a fool. But the little tiny, teeny, tiny silver lining is it may be the beginning of the end for this team which should have already began at WrestleMania by them losing the titles, but they didn't. So now we're still getting the same old shit. This whole thing was very, very dumb. It was insulting to the women involved, insulting to the wrestling fans watching, and I don't want to see more shit like this. We got to see a post-mania interview with Bad Bunny and Damian Priest talking about how happy he was to help put over Priest. Priest then was talking about how hard... Bad Bunny worked, and it showed he deserved his moment, and sure he did. He put in the work, and he put on one of the, if not the very best celebrity match in WrestleMania history. You gotta give credit where credit is due. And I didn't mind it. And Normally, you would think that's crazy of me to say, because I was so against all of this going into WrestleMania, but he proved himself. He showed respect for the industry, and he knocked it out of the park. So I'm fine with Bad Bunny. I don't know why we had to really promote his concert and everything tonight, but I don't mind. I guess one hand washes the other, right? He helps WWE at WrestleMania. Now they're going to help him promote his sold-out concert tour, and congratulations to him on that. That's fine. The only bad thing to come out of this is that somehow Damian Priest is still in the mix-up with The Miz. John Morrison was not here tonight for some strange reason. If if that's a sign of Miz and Morrison breaking up in the future, I'm fine with that too. I don't know what the reason was. They didn't make real, any, really any mention of it. But Maurice was with him. And we were going to have a Miz TV episode where they're going to give each other kisses and have champagne and explode fireworks and whatnot. All because Miz and Mrs. had a great premiere last week. 
and I am bored to tears. Now, I don't mind looking at Marie. She's absolutely beautiful. And I do, in fact, watch Ms. and Mrs. because I'm a wrestling idiot and I watch anything that has anything to do with wrestling. And I know it's extremely scripted and it's actually more entertaining than a, than an episode of Raw. I prefer Mike the Miz on his reality show than I do on the wrestling show. It's He's just... <laughs> I guess maybe more himself. I don't know. But it's just more entertaining than the shit he does on Monday Night Raw. Then Damian Priest comes out. Damian Priest comes out to crash the party. And I'm fine with that. But they script him terribly. They fed him lines where he had to take digs on Jake Paul. Said, Miz, you're as delusional as Jake Paul. Thinking that he's a real actual fighter. Said Miz is boasting about his win last week, but didn't mention how he won the match, how he cheated to win the match. They actually had to show the replay. Then he wondered what kind of man would brag about winning like that. He spoke in Spanish, and Miz was like, what'd you just say to me? And he was like, you lost your pants, man. The whole world saw you had no balls. Only he said cojones, because, you know, he's from Puerto Rico. Then Maurice offered up her husband in a match. (laughs) And now we have this match. Damian Priest versus The Miz. But before we got to see that match, we have some more stupid shit, because that's going to come later in the night. The New Day was backstage with Matt Riddle in the back so that they could talk about pancakes and stuff. Matt Riddle's all happy about beating Randy Orton. The New Day congratulated him for beating Randy Orton. And then they stand there as Matt Riddle scoots his ass away, and the New Day were just like, do you know what he said? And they're like, no, continuing to push further the fact that Matt Riddle is a complete blithering idiot. And I hate this side of his story. Just let him be an MMA fighter, or just let him be a normal human being with a functioning brain. And it'll be much more entertaining. Then we get Elias... With Jackson Riker, of course, taking on Kofi Kingston. Elias with a shocking win here. Shocking win. He beats Kofi Kingston with a Randy Savage flying elbow from the top rope. And this defeat came in less than five minutes. And I do not understand it whatsoever. Do you realize that Kofi Kingston is a former WWE champion? And he is losing to Elias. A glorified jobber in less than five minutes on Monday Night Raw. Why? Do you have plans to push Elias now? Are you changing his character up somewhat? Because it doesn't look like it. He's still showing up doing the same shtick that he did in 2017. He gets his whole segment interrupted tonight, of course, as it always is. But this time we got... Xavier Woods coming out, playing the bass. If you follow Xavier Woods on any social media platform, you know that he's just recently picked up on on the bass guitar, and he wants to learn it, and he's been killing it, actually. He's learning very well. He played the Stone Cold Steve Austin theme song tonight, which is one of the easier songs to play, sure, but you still require some rhythm to pull it off, and Woods did so. So now we have a duel going on of sorts. You got Elias in the ring with his acoustic and you got Xavier with the bass and really it all meant a whole lot of nothing. All it meant was we were going to have this match and Elias won for some godforsaken reason. They gave the win to this guy over a former WWE champion. And all I could ask myself during this entire segment is where is AJ? Where are almost an AJ? Where are the tag team champions? For the second week in a row, you got nothing for them, but I'm watching Xavier Woods. I'm sorry, I'm watching Kofi Kingston with Xavier Woods fight Elias with Jackson Riker. Why? Awful. Just rinse and repeat shit. Perhaps the only thing that was interesting on this show, Alexa's Playground, I... I I'm like 50-50 with this because I need to see what they're doing with The Fiend in order to understand where they're going with Alexa Bliss. Because did they really just take Bray Wyatt's character and just give it to Alexa? And now they're just going to let her run with it? You know, is Lily her sister Abigail? Is she going to have a mask face 
at some point? Is she going to have an alter ego that is Lily? I don't understand where they're going. I think I've said I don't understand maybe a million times tonight, and it's appropriate, though, because this show is so confusing. Confusing. Where did The Fiend go? The Fiend lost to Randy Orton, and he disappeared. But it, but Bray Wyatt was back in the funhouse last week. We didn't have him again this week, but we have Alexis Playground that has the same song that Firefly Funhouse has, only it's distorted. And Alexa wants to tell us now that she's had Lily forever. We've all been following Alexa Bliss. If you're a fan of Alexa Bliss or you've been watching pro wrestling, you've seen her around for the last half a decade or so, and she's never once ever been a demonic type of character, never once had that snap type quality where maybe you could think that this was true. You just got to buy in, right? So if you just forget the logic and you buy in and you listen to her talk about how she pushed a little girl off of a swing or off of a seesaw or whatever fucking playground thing they were on, she pushed off some girl to eat her strawberry ice cream, even though she didn't like strawberry ice cream to begin with. And she did all of this because Lily made me do it. You know, like, the devil made me do it. Only the devil is Lily. And then they do the same thing with Lily. They show her close up, and she does this little weird mouth thing. Whatever, again, from Bray Wyatt. And then we have the rapid cut of the creepy images, like a Wyatt family promo coming to an end. Alexa Bliss says that Lily didn't like him, I guess referring to The Fiend, but she also doesn't like everybody on the women's roster. And then Alexa did her creepy laugh. And her acting is on par. It's great. I just need to understand where it's going. It's so confusing. And why would they take a character that was developed by one person for himself and just hand it to somebody else and say, here you go, let's run with it. I... I'm enjoying her performance. I'm just not enjoying the negative effects it's seeming to have on The Fiend. And for me, The Fiend lost his luster as soon as he lost to Seth Rollins in the Hell in a Cell all those many, many moons ago. But, I mean, just when you thought we were on the cusp of him coming back and doing something special, I mean, everything's going to Alexa. What is this going to turn into? I guess we're going to have to keep watching this trash to find out. Sarah Schreiber was in the back with Mandy Rose and Dana Brooke. They're giggling about how they screwed over Nia Jax. And then Nia Jax comes into the screen and they run away like a couple of little bitches. And then she, this is where they plant those seeds for Jax and Baszler's eventual split up. Shayna Baszler's all pissed off now. And why this conversation didn't already happen, because the tag team match was probably like 20 minutes before this segment, but only now is Shayna confronting Nia Jax, telling her she needs to get her shit together, she needs to start to focus, get her head in the game. And then out of nowhere, Angel Garza shows up, asks Nia Jax what she sees in Reginald, the circus clown he called him, What do you see in that circus clown Reginald, a guy that she hasn't had at ringside with her in about two and a half weeks? He didn't go out there with her at WrestleMania, as far as I remember. He wasn't out there with her last week, and he wasn't out there again this week. So are they even still a thing? What, did he forget to come to work? Not that I care. I'm happy to not see Reginald. Because all he did was bring the show down, and he puts more of a focus on the silly side of things. But what the hell does this mean? Is Angel Garza going to try to get with Nia Jax now? Why does everybody love Nia Jax? Except for us. I don't get it. Third hour begins with the two-on-one handicap match. Drew McIntyre defeated T-Bar and Mace via disqualification. Braun Strowman then enters after they wouldn't stop beating up Drew McIntyre because, you know, he's king of the bullies or king of the defender of the bullies or whatever he is now since he beat Shane McSweatstain at WrestleMania. And then, of course, they turned this into a Teddy Long special. Holla, 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 brother. We got to turn this into a tag team match. And T-Bar and Mace would then go on to defeat Drew McIntyre and Braun Strowman via disqualification again. 
So now you kind of have a 50-50 booking scenario right here, right? Because T-Bar and Mace lost by disqualification, and then they won the second half of this contest by disqualification, and you have that in the same match, and that just shows you how inept they are at booking pro wrestling. Braun Strowman just beat the snot out of everybody for a couple of minutes. Some of the action was pretty interesting, but at the end of the day, there was nothing here. And then Drew McIntyre ripped Mace's face mask off and revealed him to be, oh my God, it's that guy that used to do the commentary that Brock Lesnar put through the table, Dio Madden. Can you imagine? I didn't know. He then started beating the shit out of Maze with the mask to the point where the ref calls for the DQ. This prompted a standoff between T-Bar, T-Bag, our old buddy T-Bag, and Braun Strowman, where Braun Strowman takes his mask off and starts beating the snot out of him with it, revealing him to be Dominic Dijakovic. Oh, I had no idea. The best thing about this segment was the fact that those masks came off, and I hope that they fucking stay off. And now stop calling them Teabag and Mush, and refer to them, but can't they just be Dio and Dominic, or Dijakovic and Dio? Or just Dio Madden and Donovan Dijakovic. It'll be fine. You'll be fine, I promise. Change their gear. Change their music, because they're not Retribution. Why are they still coming out to Retribution music? And call it a day on that angle. Wrap it up and throw it away. If you're going to set them on a course to be different and do something different, you got to start at the basics and wipe away that shit that's still remaining on them from being part of Retribution. Damian Priest defeated The Miz in five minutes. Cares. This was a repeat of the match last week, except Damian Priest was smart to the Miz's games, and even though he tried to, the Miz tried to win the same way he did last week by putting his feet on the ropes, Priest kicked out, nailed him with the hit the lights, gets the pinfall, one, two, three. We then had Sheamus' segment. My favorite thing about this segment is the fact that he, he came out, he was talking about being the United States champion, he was being really sarcastic, talking about he's going to be a fighting champion. The challenger came out, and it was Dr. Dimples, Humberto Carrillo, who we haven't seen in in the ring in anything relevant in months now. And before this match could even get started, Sheamus attacked, beat the ever-loving shit out of Humberto Carrillo without even taking his hat off. He wanted to... Keep his style, man. With his hat on, just beating the tar out of this guy. The only reason it came off is because he needed to wipe the, sp the sweat from his brow. So he removed his hat himself and was like, Woo, this beating is taking a lot out of me, kicking the shit out of this little guy. Boom. Put his <laughs> All I wanted was for him to put his hat back on and continue with the beating. But he finished it off with a broke kick to Umberto right in his Dr. Dimple face. This wasn't a match, it was just a beatdown. Made Sheamus look great, made him look like a badass, a tough guy, and all the things that we all know Sheamus to be. A heel champion would do something along the lines that he did here tonight, so I was totally okay with this. The only negative about this is tough shit for Humberto Carrillo, <laughs> who continues to be buried deeper and deeper into the, the never-ending, bottomless, catering trash bin that is the WWE talent pool. Then we had the main event. Of course, we had to see Charlotte Flair getting ready before this match because we can never have enough Charlotte on TV. Asuka went one-on-one -on -one with Charlotte Flair. Once again, we've seen this match about 17 times in the last two years. Who really cares about anything Charlotte is doing at this point? Unless you're a huge fan or a huge mark for Charlotte Flair, you, like me, have to be sick to death of her. You wonder why the girls on the roster don't like her, because she gets handed everything, all this TV time. She does nothing to really maximize it. We see the same match from her over and over again. It's the same spots, the same shit, nothing unique, nothing different. It's just the same Charlotte Flair package 
over and over and over again. This match, you knew right off the bat, was not going to have a clean finish simply due to the fact that Rhea Ripley was outside. Charlotte Flair gets Asuka into the figure eight, but she's too close to the ropes. Rhea Ripley pulls her out of position. Asuka frees herself from this and then used a roll-up and crucifix-style roll-up for a win, which pissed off Charlotte Flair. And here's how you know everything I say about Charlotte is true. Now, obviously, you know they were going to have her beat up the referees to get this indefinite suspension that we reported on at the beginning of the show. But the entire show ended with nothing but the focus being on Charlotte Flair. Not Asuka, who just beat Charlotte Flair. Not Rhea Ripley, the Raw Women's Champion, standing, you know, maybe side by side, victoriously, you know, celebrating the fact that they got one over on the Queen. No, we have to stay fixed, transfixed on Charlotte Flair as she beats down about three referees and the announce team keeps calling her all kinds of things. Oh, she's just a terrible. Charlotte, don't do this. And then we go off the air. One of the worst episodes of Raw that we've had to sit through all year. And that's a phrase that we say every week, but it's amazing to me how they keep topping themselves. They don't get better week to week, but they just continue to get worse and worse and worse. And will it ever get better? Probably not in our lifetimes. I think the company will go under before it ends up getting any better. Coming out of WrestleMania... And the worst WrestleMania, Raw after WrestleMania that we had to sit through last week. They have moved some of the pieces on the board. They have changed some of the story directions. But still, nothing is looking very good at all. And after a very disappointing Friday Night Smackdown, I'm also not looking forward to having to sit through that this coming Friday as well. You know, as a guy who celebrates 420 every day, tomorrow being 420, I thought maybe I did a little bit too much celebrating on my own tonight when this show was as bad as it is. And maybe it's me. Maybe I'm just smoking myself into a point where nothing is enjoyable. But that would be the opposite effect. Because when you smoke, you know, some of you smokers, you, you know how you feel. It makes you be able to tolerate idiot people get you through the day of work. Sometimes, you know, some of you are smoking it for your glaucoma or your arthritis. But, you know, it's all supposed to be positive, supposed to make you feel better. So there's no way that you could blame that for me feeling how bad this show actually is. Maybe that's the reason why Matt Riddle was so stupid enough to challenge Randy Orton tonight. Because he's smoking a little bit too much. Pre-celebrating tomorrow's 420 holiday. And if you're in the know and you know what it's about, have a great time tomorrow. I know I'm going to try to do my best to do the same. Thank you all so very much for joining me here tonight. This is the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. My name is Nick Nightmare. This is the team, Thor the Sledgehammer, the official Sledgehammer of the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show. His tag team partner, the new and improved world heavyweight champion of all the microphones in all the world, Blue the Yeti Microphone. And the most important member of the team, as always, each and every one of you. Now is the time for you to smash that like button if you enjoyed anything we said, did, or talked about here today. Make sure you share this video with each and every one of your wrestling buddies all over the wrestling world, especially if they need a place to come and talk about and shit on professional wrestling. I welcome all comers, and we encourage everybody who has not just yet to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any time we bring the hammer down on an episode of WWE TV because nobody does it the way we does it. And I can't do it without you guys. If you missed anything from WrestleMania and uh, the Raw after WrestleMania or anything else we reviewed, it will be linked in the eye above my head. And I thank you guys and love you so much for your continued support of this show. That's going to do it, Sledge Nation. We are out of here. And we will see you next time right here on your new favorite wrestling show, the Sledgehammer Wrestling Show, only on Sledgehammer TV, right here on YouTube.com, the home of the Poop Hammers. <laughs>